All right, now that we've reviewed over the basics of our 12 lead EKG, uh, including the steps to go through when evaluating one, I do wanna dive a little deeper into a few different topics that I mentioned in that last lesson. The first of these is gonna be understanding about and looking for the bundle branch blocks, which we'll discuss now. All right, I welcome you guys back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and my goal with this channel here is to try to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by taking these complex critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that. If I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel below. Uh, make sure you hit that bell icon, though. That way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Now also, if you do enjoy these lessons and you'd be interested in getting CE credits for following along with them, uh, then head on over to icuadvantage.com forward slash academy and join the ICU Advantage Academy where you can watch all these videos. You'll have access to all the notes, including the new notes that I'm currently working on updating, as well as audio only versions of these lessons. And most importantly, you'll be able to actually earn CE credits for participating in this education. So I've got some great deals going on over there, so make sure and check that out. Now, if you would like to support the channel but really don't have a need for the CEs, or if you just want access to things like the notes, then you might also want to take a look at either the YouTube or Patreon memberships. Again, links to both of those. All that stuff is going to be down in the description below. All right, when we're talking about the bundle branch blocks, we're talking about defects in part of the electrical conduction system of the heart. So earlier in this series, I did a review over just that, so I'll link to that up above. Uh, and Make sure and watch that if you haven't already or you really need a refresher on this conduction system. In order to understand what's happening, let's take a look at the mechanisms that are at play with these blocks by looking at a diagram of the heart. So again, remember that conduction typically starts with our SA node and then it is transmitted to the AV node, which after its delay, the signal is then conducted down the bundle of His and then to the right and left bundle branches. Also remember that our left bundle branch quickly then branches into both our left posterior fascicle and our left anterior fascicle. And so these bundle branches here, this is where we are having our problem. What is happening, as the name suggests, is that either the bundle branch or the fascicles are becoming blocked and really no longer can conduct the electrical signal appropriately. And this is the result of injury to these bundle branches or fascicles, um, oftentimes from underlying heart disease or myocardial infarction. So when we have healthy functioning bundle branches, the electrical conduction is quickly moved throughout the ventricles out into those Purkinje fibers, which connect to the cardiac myocytes, and then thus leads to rapid depolarization of the ventricles, causing that quick, synchronized, forceful contraction. Once we block one of these branches, the affected areas of the heart really are no longer receiving the conduction quickly. So, for example, if we were to block the right bundle branch, then the right ventricle is not going to quickly depolarize while the left ventricle is still going to be rapidly depolarizing. As the left ventricle depolarizes, it's going to pass this depolarization along to the rest of the heart via those ion channels, those gap junctions going cell to cell, which will eventually and slowly depolarize the right ventricle. So all of this results in a loss of the synchrony of those ventricles, uh, along with that prolonged depolarization, both of which can actually contribute to a drop in cardiac output. So now let's talk about the electrophysiology of what's happening and really what we expect to see with our 12 lead. So again, if we take a look at our heart here, you'll remember that we have you know, our six chest leads, V1 through V6, which are really looking at the heart uh, across that horizontal plane. Of these leads, we have V1, which is going to be our most rightward lead in relation to the patient's heart. And then the most leftward lead is going to be V6. And these are going to be the, the most important leads for us to look at and to understand the changes that we'd expect to see. So looking at the heart from V1 and V6, let's start off looking at what we'd expect to see with normal conduction in the heart. So here we're evaluating our QRS complex as this is what is our ventricular depolarization. So to start things off, 
as the electrical signal is passed from the AV node down the bundle of hiss into the left and right bundle branches, the first thing that we're going to see is actually going to be septal depolarization. So this normally results from a small branch off the left bundle branch, and then this propagates in a left to right direction. Now again, remember from that previous lesson on the introductory concepts of our 12 lead that if the electrical conduction is moving towards our positive lead, that we would then see a positive waveform, and if it's moving away, we're going to see that negative waveform. So knowing this, with this initial left to right depolarization of the septum, this is going to be moving to the right side, so towards V1, we would see a small positive deflection to start here. On the other hand, when we're looking at V6, this conduction is now moving away, therefore we'd expect to see this small negative deflection to start. Now from here, we still have rapid transmission of the electrical signal down normal healthy bundle branches, which then quickly makes it through the Purkinje fibers and into the ventricles, rapidly depolarizing both the left and right ventricles. Now again, remember we have signals moving in many different directions, but our mean electrical direction due to the size of that left ventricle is going to be leftward. So when we're looking at V1, this means that the electrical activity is going to be moving mostly away from this lead, leading to that large negative deflection in our tracing. On the other hand, when we're looking at V6, now the electrical activity is moving towards this lead, giving us a large positive deflection. Now with both of these, once the heart is fully depolarized, we're going to see that rapid return to the baseline isoelectric line. So looking at these two leads with normal electrical conduction, these are the patterns that we would expect to see. Now let's actually take a look at how this changes with our blocks. Do keep in mind that for the next couple sections, we're going to talk through what's happening and what we expect to see. That I'm going to use illustrations that I do here of kind of what we would expect to see with our leads. But as you're going to see in a little bit with some example EKGs, the exact morphology will look slightly different from EKG to EKG. All right, so now let's take a look at what happens when we have a right bundle branch block. So things now begin to change both in how our electrical conduction and depolarization takes place, uh, as well as how we're going to see that represented on our 12 lead. So now walking through this example here, we have this block in the right bundle branch, and so the signal is not going to be moving down here. So starting out, we have our septum, which is still depolarized normally from the properly functioning left bundle branch, and this is going to be again in that left to right direction. In V1, we again see that initial small positive deflection as the signal moves in that direction. In V6, since this conduction is moving away, we'd expect to see a small negative deflection, but for some reason with right bundle branch block, this often doesn't actually show. So then from there, we then have the left ventricle, which is going to begin rapidly depolarizing first. Here again, most of the electrical activity is going to be going towards the left. So this actually gives us an initial negative deflection in V1, and then a positive deflection in V6. Now following this, that wave of depolarization is going to be slowly moving across the right ventricle, and then this is going to lead to large electrical activity on the right, but it's also going to be slower which on our 12 lead, time is represented moving side to side. Therefore, in V1, with this electrical activity moving towards this lead slowly, we're then going to see another positive deflection, this time with a much wider than normal complex. So this actually gives us our classical appearance of a right bundle branch block in V1, um, which is characterized by something that uh, sometimes is referred to as either rabbit ears or m shape. So you can see with our two R waves that this is where we get that appearance from. It either looks like a pair of rabbit ears or it just gives us that M shape to it. Now looking at V6, here with the electrical activity moving away, we're going to see a negative Y deflection. And then finally, we need to talk about our T wave. So with right bundle branch block, it's actually normal for us to have a T wave that's going to go in the opposite direction of the terminal wave of our QRS complex. So this is something that we refer to as T-wave discordance, and again, this is going to be normal in our bundle branch blocks. So here in V1, since our terminal wave is positive, we would then see a negatively deflected T-wave. Thus in V6, since our terminal wave is negative, here we should be seeing a positive deflection of our T-wave. 
So this should be clearer in a little bit when we take a look over some example EKGs. Keep in mind that because of the changes that we see with the right bundle branch block, that this actually mimics other pathological changes that we can see, and thus a right bundle branch block actually limits our ability to diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy, um, which I will be discussing in a future lesson. All right, so now on the other side, if we have our left bundle branch that is blocked, we're going to see things change differently. So here, that intraventricular septum is normally depolarized from the left bundle branch. But since it's blocked here, this means that it's either going to be depolarized in a right-to-left fashion or normally left-to-right at a later point. So we may see early right-to-left depolarization and thus a small negative deflection in V1 and a small positive deflection in V6. But in reality, typically these aren't present with our 12 lead with a left bundle branch block. Moving on, so... Now we still have the right ventricle that's going to be rapidly depolarized, while at the same time, this much larger left ventricle is going to be slowly depolarized. So this tends to lead to the mean electrical activity being slow and towards the left. So thus, what we see is a large, wide negative deflection in V1, so as we're moving away to the left, and a large positive deflection in V6 as we're moving towards that lead. And then finally, again, just like with our right bundle branch block, we are going to see that T wave discordance. So along with the T wave discordance, we're also going to see a shift in our J point. So what this means is that the J point and the T wave deflection are going to be shifted away from the majority of the QRS complex. So for example, when we're looking at V1, we have our complex with a large negative deflection. We're going to see the J point actually shifted the opposite direction, thus positive above the isoelectric line with a then positively deflected T wave. And as you can see, this actually mimics ST elevation. Then in V6, we have a large positive deflection with our complex, so we're going to see that J point shifted negative of that isoelectric line with a negatively deflected T wave. Again, this here can also appear as ST depression. So just like with the right bundle branch block, this shifted J point and T wave discordance will also be present with other pathologies and can impede our diagnosis of either left ventricular hypertrophy as well as our STEMI. Um, to help differentiate STEMI from other pathologies that do have this shifting J point and T wave discordance, have something that we call Scarboza's criteria, which is actually something I'm going to further discuss in the future lesson talking about STEMI and our 12 lead. All right, so now that we have the basics of the changes we'd see with our bundle branch blocks on our EKG tracing, let's actually talk about how we identify and diagnose these. So essentially, the anatomical location of the defect to the conduction system is going to be how we determine and classify the blocks as either right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block. Uh, the left bundle branch can further be divided uh, into those fascicles, and sometimes we can have just one of the fascicles blocked as opposed to both of them being blocked or the left bundle branch as a whole, but these are going to be beyond the scope of this series that I'm doing here. So in order to truly diagnose a bundle branch block, we need to have a wide QRS complex. So this means greater than 0.12 seconds or three small boxes. So we can have incomplete bundle branch blocks that have a bundle branch block morphology, but our QRS complex is less than 0.12 seconds. But again, this is going to be beyond the scope of this series here. So once we have uh, identified a wide QRS complex, we want to look at the morphology of this complex in V1. So here we're going to evaluate the large terminal wave. Remember that this lead is on the right side of the heart, and thus if we have a large positive terminal wave, that this would be indicative of a right bundle branch block. If this terminal wave is negative, this means we're moving away from this electrode and thus would be indicative of a left bundle branch block. So the easiest way to remember this is to think of the turn signal on your vehicle. So whatever direction your terminal wave is, so think up positive or down negative, think about what direction you would be going if you hit your turn signal that way. If you hit your turn signal up, you're going to be turning right, thus a right bundle branch block. If you hit it down, you're going to be turning left, thus a left bundle branch block. All right, so then from there, we should expect to see the opposite in V6 with the terminal wave, as again, this lead is now on the other side of the heart. Also keep in mind that our 
Lateral leads, leads one and ABL, also have a very similar direction that we're looking at when we look at V6. And so they're also gonna present with these similar morphologies that we'd see with V6. With all of this said, there certainly are further characteristics that are used to really properly evaluate and diagnose these bundle branch blocks. But again, this is gonna go deeper into 12 leads than I think is necessary for this basic interpretation series. All right, so now let's quickly talk about our bundle branch blocks and show some examples as well. So to start, let's talk about our right bundle branch blocks and some of the potential causes of right bundle branch blocks can include things like right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, or core pulmonal, uh, acute pulmonary embolism, PE can do this, ischemic heart disease, congenital heart disease, myocarditis, as well as cardiomyopathy can all potentially lead to a right bundle branch block. Now also, most people, the right bundle branch block is perfused by the left anterior descending artery, and thus they may manifest with blockage of this artery. All right, so now let's take a look at a couple uh, examples of 12 leads. So here is our first example here, and let's start things off by measuring our QRS duration. So some of these leads, it is hard to tell if the QRS is actually wider than 0.12 seconds or three small boxes. But if we do look at V2, I think it's clear that we're somewhere between three to four small boxes, making this a wide QRS. Now we wanna take a look at V1. Here we can see that we have that classic rabbit ears or M shape that's typical with a right bundle branch block. In addition, our terminal wave is positive or up, which if we're using our turn signal and flip it up, we're turning right, thus a right bundle branch block. We also have the appropriate T wave discordance with an opposite negative deflected T wave. And then finally, if we look at V6, uh, as well as our other lateral leads, one and AVL, we'll see that we have our terminal deflection negative opposite of our positive terminal deflection seen in V1. All right, so let's take a look at another example. Uh, and here in this example, again, some of the leads are hard to tell, but especially when we're looking at V1, it is clear that our QRS is greater than 0.12 seconds or three small boxes. So further evaluating V1, we again have that classic rabbit ears or M shape with that terminal wave deflected up or positive, along with that discordant negative T wave deflection. Thus, using our turn signal method, we know we're turning right, thus a right bundle branch block. And again, finally, our terminal wave in V6, as well as one in AVL, are deflected negatively opposite of what we have in V1. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about our left bundle branch blocks. And uh, some of the causes here would include things like aortic stenosis, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, as well as hyperkalemia and digoxin toxicity, that these can all lead to a left bundle branch block. The left bundle branch is also perfused by primarily the LAD, but also times in part by the RCA, and thus blockages in either of these can also potentially manifest in left bundle branch blocks. All right, so again, let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here in this first example, if we look at our QRS, I think it's much more clear here that we do have a wide QRS greater than 0.12 seconds. So we then move on and take a look at morphology in V1. And as we can see, we've got this large negative terminal deflection. Using our turn signal method, flipping the turn signal down means we're turning left. Thus, this is our left bundle branch block morphology. We also note a positively shifted J point, so going opposite of that negative deflection, as well as that positively deflected T wave, both of these mimicking that ST elevation. And then finally, looking at V6, we can see we have the opposite with the large positive terminal wave, negative J point shifting, and negative T wave discordance. All right, one more example. In this example here, again, looking at our QRS, I think it's quite clear that we're greater than 0.12 seconds. Switching over and looking at V1, we see we've got that deep wide negative terminal deflection. The turn signal method tells us we're turning left, thus left bundle branch block morphology. Um, again, we see that positive J point shifting and positive T wave discordance opposite of that terminal negative deflection. And then finally, looking at V6, it's really not very clear, so we can evaluate our other lateral leads, one in AVL. Things are a little clearer here, but certainly better with AVL. Here we now have that positive terminal wave, opposite of V1, with negatively shifted J-point, 
and negative T wave discordance. All right, and those are our bundle branch blocks and the basics of kind of what's going on with those, which when you kind of think about that and think about those lead placements, kind of makes sense with how those changes are going to manifest on our 12 lead EKG, as well as just some general points of when you're looking at these EKGs, how you can quickly evaluate through and determine, do we have a wide QRS? If so, do we have a bundle branch present based on that morphology in V1, as well as the opposite taking place in those lateral leads? So I really hope that I was able to explain this information in a way that makes sense for you guys and that you can carry this forward and evaluate those 12 leads and determine if you have right or left bundle branch blocks that are taking place. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.